Good morning, everybody. This is our fifth video of the Global Contemporary Unit, fifth out of six. Uh, video number five is all about looking at and reinterpreting traditions. So we're going to look at how artists uh, do that in the contemporary age, which is from 1980 on. Um, you might ask why we don't have any works from like past 2009. Uh, it's because of the development of this curriculum and it's been the same for about five years now and um, so it takes a little bit to update and modify so just a little aside we've looked at our historical context a little more today i want you to think about what role tradition plays in our everyday lives and our understanding so think about your own traditions your own background and how that has impacted the way that you view the world the way that you um, create ideas and think about things. Uh, we have five works, they're all very, very different. Uh, so let's jump right in. So the first work is by an artist named Song Sunam uh, from Korea, it's called Summer Trees. And when you first look at this canvas here, or ink on paper, my apologies, um, you might not even see anything that resembles trees. Uh, at first you just see these long linear elements that are varying shades of gray. Um, and then you might notice just the white down at the bottom and there are these smaller linear elements down at the bottom. So we know that it's trees based on the title and they're very, very abstract. These are not realistic trees, but it's supposed to give you the feeling of trees in this more modern context. So um, he, the artist uses ink on paper for most of his works. Some of the ink is applied when wet. So if you look at these trees in the center here, you might notice the blurring on the edges. That's when you have wet paper and you apply ink and then it kind of spreads out. Whereas if you look over here, this one was applied on dry paper. And so you get this kind of more crusty edge uh, that you see in that space. So kind of using multiple different techniques in the one work. Uh, there's a lot of overlapping between these different gray pieces, similar to how there would be with trees in a forest. Um, and they're very, very simplified, as I mentioned before. So how in the world is this reinterpreting tradition? Uh, it's a great time for us to go back and look at a work by Fan Quan, Travelers by Stream and Mountains. Uh, so this was a hanging landscape, a, um, a scroll that would hang down with the landscape painted on it. And this was a very, very traditional form um, of art at the time. So just to kind of go back a little bit, uh, 10th and 11th century, uh, a lot of Taoist scholars were becoming reclusive, heading to the mountains, wanting to return to a more simple time away from technology and focus on their own spirituality and their own connection with nature. Um, in the same way, Neo-Confucianism was very popular at the time, and that focuses on opposing forces. You can think of yin and yang, or um, I think it was li and qi. Um, and also focusing on that inner spirituality. So these are traditional themes by focusing on nature to kind of bring you back, center yourself um, away from the technologies and the city and the, the chaos. So fast forward away from the 10th and 11th century uh, to uh, Sunam, Song Sunam. Uh, and this artist was one of the leaders of the Oriental Ink Movement in the 1980s. So the goal of this movement was to try to recover national identity. Uh, Korea had suffered from lots and lots of things that were kind of seen as an embarrassment or uh, hurting the national identity. Think about colonization, think about uh, the separation with North Korea, and then all of the issues that have come about. Um, with North Korea. Uh, think about the American military presence that was required, wars, so a lot of things that kind of hurt that national identity of people. And so this was a chance to promote the inner spirituality and that connection back to nature, trying to bring back some of the tradition and the history, the beautiful history of Korea um, and their traditions that they got from uh, China and Japan and, and also their own uh, traditions that they created. So the medium that it was created in is traditional. This is an ink wash painting similar to what we had with the ink on silk or ink on painter of some traditional uh, landscape paintings. And the subject is very traditional too. We see trees which um, in art in general have a long history but specifically in this region of the world they are often uh, 
reminders of gatherings of friends, connection, uh, just pure beauty, uh, everything away from money, power, greed, technology, just like grounding forces in the earth so they kind of ground you as a human being. So he's taking those elements and modernizing them. We see very naturalistic, realistic um, portrayals of plants in the uh, previous pieces. However, in this one, he's modernizing and taking that traditional idea of the trees, the landscape, and bringing about uh, some newness to it. So continuing on, uh, here are a couple other works of his. Uh, you can see a lot of them are very, very similar, very minimalistic, but you do see elements that remind us of trees, remind us of forest, and they also have some of the color palette that reminds us of the traditional style of uh, landscape painting with ink. All right, moving on. Uh, this piece is called Androgen 3 by Magdalena Abakanowitz. Might be messing that up, but... We'll do the best we can. Uh, so this piece was made of burlap, resin, wood, nails, and string. So the wood you see down at the bottom here, this is the kind of post system that supports it. Uh, and the string is on the end of these posts. The burlap and the resin are actually this part right here. She takes pieces of burlap and dunks them in resin and then puts them over molds to create these forms. And I'll show you the other side of it in a second that helps you understand it more. So this is a quote reflecting uh, kind of the birth of this idea of her uh, series of work. Um, and it's about her experience in World War II with her family. They lived in Poland. We as a family lost our identity. We were deprived of our social position and thrown out of society. We were punished for being rich. So I had to hide my background. I had to lie. I had to invent. So a little more context to kind of help you out with that. So um, in Poland at the time, she had a, an estate that she lived on, kind of in the countryside, and things were not going well with World War II. German soldiers were invading, uh, and it was so bad that at a certain point, some German soldiers that were drunk came to their estate and actually came into the house, started taking things, um, and actually one of the soldiers right in front of her as a child uh, shot her mother's arm right off. Uh, just kind of, yeah, a terrible memory for a child to have. Um, and so obviously after this, they flee um, and she stays in Warsaw for the rest of her life with her family. And you can imagine that that's a very traumatic event for a child to um, experience, let alone all of the things that followed um, as the war progressed. So lots of emotion, lots of... Um, feeling that a lot of people could connect with at the time after World War II because it was so all-encompassing uh, across many different cities, countries, um, groups of people. So anyway, after the war um, in Poland, nobility were considered the enemy. So she actually, even though she was wealthy beforehand, she had to give up everything, her childhood home, all of her financial stability, and still kind of had to hide her identity because she would be seen as an outsider or the enemy of most of the people, even though she was mistreated. Um, so after the war, she goes to art school in communist Poland, uh, and she studied social realism, which was the style of the time. That was what you studied if you went to art school in this area. And social realism focuses on showing the perfect society, happiness of workers. I like to think of it as the cultural revolution, some of the styling um, of some of the artwork of Mao, the propaganda. Um, and so she studied in this way because that's what she had to do. Uh, but then when she left school, she completely you know, got rid of that and started to make her art the way she wanted to. So as promised, I have this picture to show you the other side of it. So when we look at the first picture we looked at, we see this kind of humanoid form kind of slumped forward. When you see somebody sitting that way, you don't think of them as full of pride, happiness, joy. You think tired, you think uh, overwhelmed, you think hurt. Uh, and then also to not have any element of a head, to not have elements of legs, especially with this protruding beam underneath that maybe makes you think of 
um, a limb that has been lost. There's a lot of emotion there just in that basic form that we see. So even without a lot of the human elements, we get this kind of feeling just from looking at that form. And then in the gallery, you could walk around to the other side and you see all it is is that piece of burlap with the resin and there's this complete negative space on the inside. So it's not an actual figure, it's not a form, it's a shell of a form. And so there's a lot of reasoning behind that. I'm sure you could think about maybe why she'd want it to just be a shell, uh, but we're gonna talk about that. So we talked about the form, um, but the point of having this shell-like piece, she wants you to think about the interior and the exterior. And that goes for the person, like your exterior, but also the person that you are inside. You can think about her history with having to hide who she was. Um, you can think about identity tied to the body, right? If there are people that have gone through atrocities in war, uh, what that does to your body, limbs you might lose. Um, but then also there's that interior, you might lose some of yourself in that way too. So she's really kind of having you think about that positive negative within your own self. Um, we mentioned the human figures. Uh, the texture on the surface of her pieces, you can kind of see from looking at these, they're all similar, they're, they use burlap. But she's got this kind of earth-like texture because of the burlap and she's okay with wrinkles forming she's okay with loose strings kind of showing because it gives this kind of connection to the earth uh, where she believes that human beings are very connected to the earth and there is a strong connection that that's kind of where we came from also the imperfections show the human cells the anatomies the, the anatomy the veins running through you so it's a way to kind of bring a little more life into these um, sculptures for her it's about focusing on the human uh, you'll notice there's no clear gender with any of her pieces she wants to highlight the human experience what trauma looks like something that everybody can kind of connect to and there's kind of a, a quiet darkness to her pieces too all right moving on very very different artist we're going to look at next uh, this is the pink panther by jeff coons uh, and it's glazed porcelain done in 1988 uh, you may instantly look at it and love it. You might instantly look at it and hate it, uh, but it's a really important piece. So let's get started. So this was a part of a show of his in the 80s called The Banality Show. Um, it was a series of works all based on banality. Uh, you'll notice the glazed and gilded porcelain. Uh, he works with that material with a lot of his pieces, and he doesn't actually make most of his artwork. Instead, he employs craftsmen to produce it. And in this case, and actually in a lot of cases with his works, he uses German and Italian craftsmen. So he goes to uh, factories where they create um, little trinkets for religious purposes, objects that people would have in their houses, uh, and he asked them to create these larger scale sculptures because they are the experts in this media and creation of this style of work. All right, so the content. Uh, he focuses on works that are considered kitsch or tchotchkes. So if you go back a couple of our uh, PowerPoints and videos, if you remember the No Crying in the Barbershop by Pepon uh, Osario, he focused on having the barbershop filled with a lot of chucherias, which were basically kitsch pieces um, from his Puerto Rican background. So in this case, we're looking at more Americanized, more um, from the 1960s on, little objects that people might have in their house. They might collect them. Uh, he uses those as his main inspiration. Uh, so they would be things you'd find in a gift shop. He uses stuffed animals, celebrities, pinup girls, advertising images, all of these things that you would be familiar with as an American in the 80s, but maybe wouldn't think of as high artwork. Um, and so the title of his series and um, a lot of his works in this show, Banality, which is the factor condition of being unoriginal. So he entitles his entire show <laughs> the fact or condition of being unoriginal. So think of artists who are trying to be unique, trying to stand out with things that are different, and instead he is kind of throwing in your face uh, the fact that his work is unoriginal. So an interesting person, to say the least. Uh, just to kind of go through it, here are some examples of some tchotchkes 
or kitsch items just to kind of familiarize yourselves. Um, I'm sure you've all seen some of these before. It might be at your grandmother's house, it might be in your current home, might be in a antique store, but a lot of them people still collect. Uh, but they're definitely not thought of as um, beautiful high art pieces to most people. A lot of people think of them as kind of outdated, just, you know, clutter, things like that. All right, so the point of his works, um, he's a very interesting guy. Uh, he wants to highlight materialism and the artificial. So he's purposely throwing out there uh, the artificial in our culture. He's asking you to question what is art and what is high art. So if you remember from Duchamp with the um, I can't, the, the fountain, that's what it is. He was asking, what is art? Is this art? And in the same way, Jeff Koons is asking, uh, is this high art or not? He believes it is, and so we have to question it. Now, the exact piece here, we have this uh, pinup girl who is based on um, a B-list celebrity uh, back in the 80s, or it might, no, it was the 60s, my apologies. And then we have the Pink Panther, who is a big celebrity, a cartoon character celebrity, also around that time period. And he has them embracing in this way that's a little bit kind of mm, tacky, a little confusing. If you look at the face of the Pink Panther, who's usually a very animated character, he's very docile, just, you know, hugging, not a lot of emotion. If you look here, his body looks very limp. But then if you look at the pinup girl, she has this low cut dress on, which has actually fallen off of her on one side and she's covering up her breast, smiling off to the side like there's a camera there. So there's this kind of interesting play of these two objects that you wouldn't normally think of as going together. Uh, so kind of makes you question, is this high art? The piece is actually pretty much life size. So the person actually looks pretty much real. Uh, he's going for shock factor. He's open to the fact that there will be some negative critique about his pieces because he's purposely playing with things that kind of give us a, a feeling that they're not really real art. They shouldn't be in the gallery. And so he's kind of asking you to really face that question. Um, he's also recreating or reinterpreting collector's items from the past pop culture images, so he's putting them in this new context to make you think about them more. And a great uh, example of something kind of similar artificially, if you remember the Maryland diptych by Andy Warhol, remember the paint that he used uh, on the left side for Marilyn Monroe, it was supposed to be very gaudy, very bright, to kind of show you the artificial nature of what um, we do to celebrities. And in the same way, he's using color palette, a color palette that's similar in this piece. All right, so a little context. Um, he polarizes the art world to this day. He's still alive, still working. Uh, a lot of times he's seen as shallow, very self-promotional, um, sometimes inauthentic. So personality-wise, too, he's very polarizing. There are many videos that you can watch to kind of get to know him and see a little bit more about him as well. Um, I mentioned already about the B-list Hollywood star um, and the Pink Panther, so... We're good on that front. So let's go on and just look at a couple more works by him. Uh, the balloon animal is a very famous one. Also, Michael and Bubbles. So Michael Jackson depicted with his monkey Bubbles. If you notice, it's done in the most gaudy way possible, covered in the gold, the makeup that's really highlighted. So he's purposely putting things out there that kind of make you cringe or have a reaction. Uh, and that's part of his artwork. And Here's a picture of him. Uh, and the last piece that we'll mention here, this is called Rabbit. And in 2009, it sold for $91 million, which was the largest sale for a living artist in the world ever. So even though he's an artist that many critics um, despise, uh, at the same time, he is an artist who is changing the art world and constantly re making you think about and question uh, the world of art. All right, two left. So this is Pure Land by Mariko Mori, done in 1998. It's a color photograph on glass. Uh, the landscape that we're seeing here is an image from the Dead Sea. You might notice there's one figure in the center kind of floating over a lotus. And then there are all of these little aliens on clouds, uh, and they all have different musical instruments. So what in the world is going on here? Uh, so Mariko works... Um, 
typically with these billboard sized images, very, very large. Uh, and they're not just images. Typically there are multiple elements to her work. Sometimes it's an image, sometimes there'll also be video elements, uh, sometimes you need 3D glasses, uh, and then a lot of times there is perfume in the air uh, and some wind kind of breeze in the space and music. So she wants you to have this full sensory experience to kind of feel the piece, not just look at it and take it in through your eyes. Uh, the, there's a lot of content and a lot of symbolism in the piece, so we'll just kind of run through it. The title, to begin with, references Buddhist paradise, uh, pure land. Uh, she is dressed, this is the artist herself, she is dressed as a Japanese goddess, uh, and her hands are in mudras, which if you remember in Buddhist culture kind of symbolize different things. It's the way the hands are placed. Uh, and the Japanese goddess that we see is named Kichi Joten. Uh, who is the goddess of happiness, prosperity, and ideal beauty. Uh, and here's another depiction of this goddess from the past that she's referring. This is her representation um, in the future. So the artist here is also holding this uh, wish-granting jewel. Uh, the jewel is something that in Japanese culture uh, and Buddhist culture represents nirvana. And then we also have all of the alien cartoon musicians, which are 3D. If we go back to the bigger one, you'll notice they're kind of blurry. And that's because this image is one that you should look at with 3D glasses and they would pop out at you. So they really kind of mess with you as you're looking at them. Um, the instruments that these alien hybrids are uh, playing are all ceremonial instruments from um, ceremonies in different cultures, religious cultures uh, within Japan. And then I mentioned the Dead Sea setting, so there's a lot of salt in the Dead Sea, which allows you to float, doesn't allow a lot of things to live in the space, um, but also salt is something that's a symbol in Shinto culture for purification. Uh, lastly, the lotus, this is a symbol that shows uh, the Buddhist belief that you could be reborn out of the lotus. So lots of content here to look at. So a lot of content in this piece, a lot of different symbolism, and when you put it all together, it probably makes you think about this connection to the past. She's reinterpreting some things from Japanese culture that we would recognize. Uh, but then she's also adding these new elements to it in a way that we've never experienced it before. Uh, so here's a little close-up on some of the aliens and a close-up of her. So she's merging traditional imagery with consumer entertainment technology. Especially the creatures that she created, these alien forms, they're not from any specific show, but they're in the style of um, many cartoon characters in Japanese culture. So she's kind of pulling things that would be referential uh, to kind of tie into her overall meaning. Uh, the piece is supposed to be multi-sensory, uh, meditative, so that you kind of have this floating feeling when you're looking at it. Especially think about the breeze coming in and the music that are all kind of hitting you at the same time. Uh, her works also are co often social commentaries on the women's on women's role in Japanese society, and also this play on tradition versus technology. Uh, so the artist spent most of her childhood in Tokyo, but she did spend some time in the United States. Uh, she went to art school, was also a fashion designer and a model, so those things have impacted her work and one of the reasons why she is often in her own pieces, because she can kind of um, portray what she really wants to. Uh, and she's really interested in the perceptions of people in urban Japan. So for a little more on that, if we look at a couple of her other pieces, um, this series was a series of photographs where she was dressed up in different ways, um, kind of alien-esque, and she would go to places in Japan, in Tokyo, and try to interact with people, and there would be photographs taken of her. And one of the things she found was that a lot of people would kind of ignore her uh, based on the fact that she was dressed up in a funny way. So there's this kind of like keeping away from things that are different. Uh, this is uh, uh, called Dream Temple. This is another one of her works. You can see she gets into sculpture. She has other digital um, hybrid depictions, which are photographs with uh, other 3D digital elements in them as well. So she is an all-encompassing artist, works in a lot of different media. All right, our last artist we're going to look at is Kiki Wolf, or Kiki Smith. Uh, and this work is called Lying with the Wolf. It is on paper. It is large scale. 
uh, and it is pinned up to the wall on this wrinkled piece of paper. And this is something that she said uh, about this work. In the Louvre, I saw a picture of Genevieve sitting with the wolves and the lambs. I had stopped making images of people for a couple years. I just wanted to make animals. But then I saw that picture and I thought it's really important to put them all together. So I drew my friend Genevieve as the Genevieve and then I made all these wolves. I didn't make lambs. So there's a little bit of humor in her approach, uh, but you can see she's using her own friend Genevieve as the Genevieve that she saw in the piece and she's taking this kind of biblical story uh, with this uh, character uh, and the wolves and lambs and she just throws out the lambs because it doesn't fit with what she wants to. So she, she takes things and kind of reinterprets them in her own way. So for the form of the piece, I mentioned it's wrinkled, it's pinned to the wall. Um, I'm not really sure why she does that with a lot of her drawn pieces. Uh, maybe it's to kind of make them more connected to you, uh, but I haven't really found anything that kind of explains that part of it. Uh, the, these works are part of a series that focus on women and their relationship with animals. Uh, you can see this one, the woman is actually stepping outside of the wolf. Uh, but in our piece that we're looking at, we have a reclining nude embracing a wolf. We know there's a long history of the reclining nude, but in this case we have this tame, docile wolf cuddling with this nude woman. Uh, and so the point of a lot of her works is to reclaim bodies from fragmentation in art, history, and society. So think about the fact that a lot of times people are breaking apart parts of the human form so you can focus on it. Think about cubism in general. It's all about breaking up the human form. And instead, she wants to kind of put the, the body back to its natural setting. She's trying to tell you that it's a social construction, like what we know of our bodies, what we think of our bodies, it's all created by society and kind of dictated by it. So you have to reclaim that and take it back. Uh, she also plays with a lot of juxtapositions in her work, a lot of contrast. So we have the mind and the body, we have male, female, we have tenderness and violence, especially with the wolf piece and predator prey, and kind of changing these relationships or making you think about them. Uh, she also wants you to think about women redefined through their own experiences. So instead of looking at um, long, long histories of women in general, she's asking you to look at just the individual experience. Uh, and then she also shies away from a lot of uh, challenging topics around women um, abortion, for example. And instead, she just wants to focus on the basic biology, the basic human form, uh, the basic anatomy of the ability to birth and nurture. Uh, her work relies on myth, biblical stories, and folk stories, but you'll notice there's not a lot of elements, unlike the work we just looked at by Mariko Mori, which had a lot of symbols um, and content to look at. Uh, Kiki Smith purposely leaves things much more simple, so you have to fill in your own blanks. You have to figure out how it makes you feel. Um, and lastly, she worked uh, previously before becoming an artist as an EMT, so she was constantly working with people and their bodies, uh, trying to save people, and this led to her interest in the work with the body. All right, here's just a couple more pieces of hers. You can see she's also a multidisciplinary artist, works in sculpture, drawing, painting, um, and there's always this kind of connection to animals, to the world, to the landscape, uh, and that's something that is common for her. So all of these artists are using things from the past, uh, stories from the past, symbols from the past, and reinterpreting them in new ways. And sometimes it's a really positive way, sometimes it's a really important um, horrific way, but you're seeing things that kind of make you think of things in the past, and that's important for each of them. All right, guys, we have one more video left in this unit. See you tomorrow.